Everything is inspired by the teachings of his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who is the founder and charge of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Om Aganati Miranda Sya Gangana Salakya Chaksurin Midi Tamyana Tajmai Sri Guru Ayan Maha Sri Jaitanya Manovi Stam Sapi Tamyana Bhutare Sayam Rupa Karamayam Tarati Swa Paradikam. So today we're going to be pretty elemental, pretty foundational. I heard a story once that in the beginning of the football season, the famous coach Vince Lombardi of the Green Bay Packers, first day of practice, he would pull out a football. He had Bart Starr, he had five or six future Hall of Famers, they'd won three or four consecutive Super Bowls, and yet on the first day of practice, he would start out the season, gentlemen, this is a football. It has so many stitches, it weighs so much, it's made of these elements, pass it around. He didn't want them to take anything for granted. He wanted them to start at the beginning, start with the fundamentals. The spirit soul. Here's a literary metaphor for death. It's, it's taken from an article in Back to Godhead magazine. Okay, just follow along. I think you'll see what it's getting at. The train speeds on through the gray light of early morning. I think of my destination and make plans. My mission is most important. Suddenly, the train begins a screeching halt. Your stop, the conductor says. I protest. No, I don't want to get off here. I bought a ticket too. No arguments, the conductor says. You must get off. He pushes me off the train onto the side of the tracks without even the chance to collect my luggage from the racks. Here I am in an unknown place with no friends, no possession, all my plans ruined. What am I to do? Now, the alarm ring saves me, ringing me opportunately back to an awakened state. What a horrible dream. And yet it hits on an aspect of our existence which is so dismal that we prefer to ignore it. And yet when we view death objectively, it's not a very difficult thing to understand. At one time or another, by disease, by accident, or by providence, every one of us will be forced out of our body for what seems an unknown destination. A death stroke doesn't wait for us to resolve our unfinished business, nor does it heed our careful moves to stave it off. When it's time to go, folks, you go. But when Lord Krishna found his friend Arjuna aggrieved over the future deaths of his relatives on the Kurukshetra war field, and by extension, Arjuna's own inevitable death. Krishna gave a one-hour course on death, dying, and life after death. Does anyone know what it was called? Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's 700 verses in the Bhagavad Gita. It's the penultimate seminar on death, dying, and life under death. The first thing Krishna says is, those who are wise, they lament, neither for the living nor for the dead. Why lamentation? Look at this picture. There has been a wreck. There has been a fatality. The relatives and friends are holding the body of the dead brother or son or cousin. And yet, from a physical point of view, if our value was equivalent to the value of our physical bodies, they shouldn't be crying over that body. They should be crying over the $45,000 BMW that was just total. But why are they not? Because we know on some level that we are more than this physical body. We know that even though the head is there, the eyes are there, the ears are there, the legs are there, the torso is there, some or other, something, or more appropriate to say, someone is missing. Let's have a scenario. We don't want to wish this on anybody, so we'll knock on wood. Let's say your boyfriend or your girlfriend or some close associate is lying there in the coffin. You're standing nearby. Oh, oh my Irene. Irene. Oh, Irene. I, I miss you so much. Some smart alley comes up and says, what are you so broken up about? As far as I can tell, Irene's there. 
She looks nice, and that pale color sort of becomes her. She's wearing one of her best dresses, and I really like the bunch of posies that she's holding in her hand. Isn't Irene right there? What is it that you're crying over? Will not the person then respond, oh, no, no, that's her body. Irene is gone. As long as the soul was within that body, bringing life and breathing and animation, the body was attracted. But as soon as the soul leaves the body, all that attraction leaves. There was a king, he loved his son more than anyone. His son passed away, the soul left the body. And the king said, don't bother me, don't bother me. He went into an unventilated, windowless room, holding, clutching the body of his son to him, crying, wailing, weeping, moaning. One day went by, two days went by. Third day began to be a kind of an odor, and not a very pleasant odor. Fourth day, the odor was more pronounced. Fifth day, one of the eyes fell out. The king said, get him out of here. Get him out of here. But his affection was never for the body. It was always for the living entity within the body. And as soon as that living entity is gone, we say, the person is gone, don't we? Krishna tells Arjuna not to evam jatuna sham, Never was there a time, Krishna says, when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. Well, we all know God's eternal, but what we may or may not know is that we're also eternal because we're parts and parcels of God. When the sun was created, the sunshine was created simultaneously, isn't it? The sunshine couldn't be created without the sun. God's eternal, we're also eternal too. That means we existed before the creation of this universe, we'll continue to exist after the desolation of this universe. We certainly existed before this body, and we'll certainly exist after the demise of this body as well. And that is because we're of the same quality as God. And yet some or other, being not as powerful as God, we've fallen. We've become associated with the material atmosphere and conditioned by this material body and by birth, death, disease, and old age. Furthermore, Krishna says to Arjuna, Nasato vidyate bhavo, na bhavo ubiyo priyadashnas tu anayas tattva to be. Says, for one who was born, death is certain. That's pretty obvious. Not saying anything anybody doesn't know. And every tombstone in the graveyard has a date of birth and has a date of death. But what many people don't know is that for everyone who dies and has not achieved purity of consciousness, birth is certain. Just as with birth, death is certain. Similarly, with death, rebirth is certain unless until one purifies and gets back to one's original state of consciousness. I'm sure you've all noticed that picture at the head of the stairs, which we call changing bodies. It talks about how the soul travels through different, you can call it stages of life, but we just say it's just different bodies. Every seven to ten years, all the cells of the body die and are replaced by new ones. If you live 80 years, you'll have had, what, eight, nine different bodies. You'll have reincarnated, re meaning changing, carnal refers to this body. You'll have changed your body eight or nine times. You're changing your body right now. The body of tomorrow will not be exactly the same body you had today. And over seven or ten years, every single cell will have replaced itself by a new cell. cell. And what is death other than the inability of cells to replace each other? At certain stage of our life, we might say, I'm a child, or I'm an adolescent, or I'm a teen, I'm a college student, I'm a new husband, I'm a new father, I'm an employee, I'm a manager, I'm a supervisor, I'm a retiree, I'm a golfer, I'm an RVer. Now in every sentence, the object referred to the body. The object of each sentence was different because the body's changing, so the word which described the body was a different word at each stage of our life. But what didn't change was the subject. I. So I'm the same, although the body's always changing. I'm always the same, and the body's never the same. So what does that tell us? I'll say a sentence and you fill in the missing word. I am blank this body. Thank you. I am not this body, which means I'm not black, I'm not white. Essentially, I'm not Hindu or Christian or Muslim or Jew. I'm not male or female. The body is changing, but the soul stays the same. <laughs> which reminds me of a little rap song that I wrote in this connection. The inner soul continues when the outer body ends like flame from wood sparks ascending 
transcending dark matter, blending with the sky, invisible to the naked eye. You cannot kill, nor can you die. You cannot burn, nor can you fry. The soul cannot be scorched by any blaze. No water can drown the spirit. No wind can make it fade. You cannot cut another, nor can you bleed. The soul is eternal, individual, indestructible, forever free from birth, death, old age, and disease. Yet house overturned or tossed, the soul can never itself exhaust. Seated in the heart, beating its drum, more power from the sun. The soul's superior force lives on and runs its endless course in God's unlimited universes. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, that which pervades the entire body, you should know to be indestructible. No one is able to destroy the imperishable soul. This is an example given in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Everything material, everything in the universe, every embodied living being, from the trees, the plants, the aquatics, the reptiles, the microorganisms, up to Lord Brahma himself, the creator of the universe, undergoes six changes. Birth, growth, duration, reproduction, dwindling, and vanishing without any exception. And yet the soul is immune from all those six changes. It is said in the 8th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, 16th verse, Abrahma bhuvanaloko purnadavada mamu pejo purnarjan mandavidyate From the highest planet in this material world, which is the planet of Lord Brahma, down to the lowest planet, there are all places of misery where repeated birth and death take place. Do you know how long Lord Brahma lives? Sahasra Yuga Pariyanta Maharya Brahmadumbiru. One season, one cosmic season is 3,400,000 years. Lord Brahma's one day is a thousand of those. For one day of Brahma, multiply 4,300,000 times a thousand. That's his one day. Multiply that by two, that's the day and night. By seven is a week, by four is a month, by 12 is a year, and he lives for 100 years. And he dies. At the end of it, he dies. Even he, with a, a lifespan which is, seems almost immortal from our perspective, at some point the sands run out of the hourglass and he dies. So what do we learn? It's not the body which is substance. It's the spirit which is substance. The body is shadow. Even the body of Lord Brahma, as long-lived as it is, is always changing. It has a point of birth. It has growth. It has duration. It has reproduction, dwindling, and vanishing. If you ever go to the Salem Post Office, I would recommend just stopping in one time, just for this experience. There's one lone tree, a little patch of grass, one lone tree outside the Salem Post Office. Some postal employee has taken upon himself to photograph that tree during all four seasons. It's kind of interesting. At least it merits one visit to the Salem Post Office, if not a second. You can imagine what it looks like in the fall, what it looks like in the winter, what it looks like in the spring, and what it looks like in the summer. The leaves and everything, totally different colors, different everything. What's constant about it? The trunk, isn't it? The trunk is the same. In every picture, the trunk is the same. The reality, that which is ever existing, which never dies, is the soul. The soul is the stuff of which reality is made. And the body is like the flowers, leaves, and buds, which change seasonally. So spirit is substance, and matter is shadow. Which brings me to another little poem. As a cloud is seated on air, so spirit supports the flesh, Take away the living force, it's just chemicals lying there, a corpse naked and bare. Not a twitch or wiggle, not a subtle wink or giggle, can't tickle it or puzzle it with a riddle, deaf, blind, mute, dumb, enough. Can't reward it, can't restore it, can't ignore it. Dead as a door now, stiff as a board. <laughs> Only thing to burn it, bury it. Earth to earth, dust to dust, ash to ashes. Infirm body versus immortal soul. Learn the difference, conquer ignorance, make a spiritual choice. Sing out, give voice, make some noise for the spiritual force. You want to make some noise for the spiritual force? I say Hari, you say Krishna. Hari. Krishna. Hari. Krishna. I say Krishna, you say Krishna. 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 I say Hari, you say Hari. 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 I say Hari, you say Rama. Hari. Rama. Hari. Rama. I say Rama, you say Rama. 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 
I say hurry, you say hurry, hurry, hurry. Good job. Prabhupada says here, the self-realized soul, that person who knows who they are in truth, is not bewildered by the change of body called death. It's just like changing your clothes. You can change your shirt, you can change your coat, but it doesn't destroy or change you. Such a self-realized soul does his or her duty as a spouse, as a mother, or father, as an employee, as a citizen. They never shirk their duties, but their sights are on home, going back home, back to God. Their sights are to go back to that spiritual world where life is eternal. You can take a fish, I think there's a slide coming up here, out of water, you can give it a house in Highland. None of that is gonna make the fish happy. Not transportation, not housing, not food. All he really wants to do is just go back in the water. And so similarly, all we really need is not another gadget or a gadget or a new diet or a different yoga teacher or a special type of car or to live in a certain neighborhood. All we really need to do is to set our sights on going back home, back to God. We are parts of God. We are made from Him. And as such, we are, as spiritual beings, sat chit ananda. We're not flesh, blood, and mucus and bile. We are eternity, bliss, and knowledge. The only difference between ourselves and God is that He's infinite and we're infinitesimal. And here's some examples. We can put a little tiny satellite into orbit. God floats millions and millions of planets effortlessly in space. We create a hundred story building and God creates millions and millions of universes. We as spiritual beings inhabit this particular body according to our karma. As conscious living beings, we're aware more or less of the pains and pleasures in our body. Right now you're feeling warm, you're feeling comfortable, you're feeling antsy, you're feeling hungry. I don't know what you're feeling, but you know what you're feeling. You're conscious, but your conscience is limited. It doesn't extend to what others are feeling necessarily. But there's another in the region of the heart coexisting with the tiny individual soul who's called the Paramatma or the super soul. He knows what's going on in every single body, in every species of life, on every planet, in every universe, both material and spiritual. He's the owner. He's the proprietor. He's omniscient. And yet he's also one. On an August day, the sun may be high in the sky, and yet that same sun is reflected on unlimited pots and reservoirs of water spread throughout the earth. You can say, oh, the sun is here, the sun is here, the sun is here, and the sun is here. At the same time, the sun is one entity, indivisible, far away in the sky. So God is one. At the same time, he's in the heart of every living being as the super soul, the proprietor, and the permitter. The dimensions, just for the conception's sake of the soul, in the Svetas of Dada Upanishad, Keshaga Satika Bhara Upanasakam Sarita Tadashum Jibara Shurupa Yupichari. So, you want to understand the length and breadth of the soul? Imagine this. You can't actually do it, but you can imagine doing it. Pull a hair out. Keshaga Satika Bhagi. And then imagine if you had a blade sharp enough, cut that tip of your hair into a a hundred parts. Throw away 99 of them. <laughs> Keep the one one hundredth part of the tip of the tear. And then do one more thing. Cut that into a hundred parts. Throw away the 99. And that one ten thousandth the size of a tip of a hair gives you some idea of the minuteness of the soul. And yet, how powerful it is. That tiny, tiny spark of God is so powerful. It drives this body for 60 or 70 years. In fact, the soul is so powerful that the body eventually gets worn out. The sword outwears its chief. The soul outwears its breast. Death is just the body can't keep up anymore. You, you have one of these Japanese swords. It's practically indestructible. You take it in and out of the sheath. After so many times, the sheath has to be replaced. The body is like the sheath and the soul is like a long-lasting sword. Now, we're parts of Krishna, small, tiny parts like sparks from a fire. Krishna 
is the supreme personality of God and the source of all opulences, which are basically divided into six categories. Wealth, strength, fame, beauty, knowledge, and humility. Aishriya, Shabhagasha, Birya, Shaya, Gyanam, Vyagarashim, Sanam, Bhagavim, Chingam. He's the embodiment, knowledge, humility, strength, beauty, fame, and wealth. Wherever we see these qualities, they are coming from God. But He has them unlimitedly and eternally. We have them to a small degree. And He presides over a world in which matter is conspicuous by its absence. The spiritual world, just like soul is substance and matter is shadow, the spiritual world is reality. This material world is like that reflection. The spiritual world are like the trees on the bank, and the material world, in which presently entangled, is like the reflection of the tree on the water. That spiritual world, Krishna describes, Natadvai Sayatirisho, Nashashanka Yatgad. In that world, there's no need of sunlight or moonlight or electricity. Everything is self-effulgent. Those souls who go back to the spiritual eternal world never come back to this world of birth and death. So how do we become happy in life? Just as our material senses are satisfied, we might be hungry, you might be feeling weak, you might be feeling unhappy and disoriented because you haven't eaten for a while. So when you eat, with each mouthful, your body gets strong, you get happier, you get more and more free from misery. But you have to put the food into the stomach. When you put the food into the stomach, that nourishes the whole body. The hand might be holding a Mars bar. And the hand might ask the question, you know, I went to a lot of trouble to get this candy bar. I don't see why I should give it up to the stomach. I think I have earned the right to enjoy it myself. But what happens when the hand tries to enjoy it? Not only does the hand not enjoy, but the whole body gets weak. One time, all the senses got together, they had a meeting, they said, why should the stomach get all the food? We're gonna go and strike. We're not gonna feed the stomach anymore. He doesn't do anything. We do all the work and he gets all the food. But what happens, of course, you figure that out, right? Everybody got weak and they realized in order for the senses to be strong and to be happy, you have to feed the stomach. This is one example that's given. Another example is given. Common sense might say, well, if I want to nourish the tree, I'll just pour water on the leaves. I'll pour water on the branches, the twigs, and the flowers. That way I'll nourish the tree. It would seem to be the way to do it. And yet... As you do that, the tree itself will get insufficient nourishment. It will die before your very eyes. And you wonder why. I'm watering the tree, but the tree is dying. Because you have to water the root of the tree, not the branches, twigs, and flowers. When you water the root of the tree, then the whole tree is nourished. Similarly, we as parts have no meaning separate from the whole. Consider the hand which won't give to the stomach. Consider the leaf which is detached from the tree, lying, yellow, withered, dry, and useless, you see. We can only be happy as parts by connecting to the whole. This is what yoga is supposed to be. Yoga means the part connecting to the whole. Yoga is not something you do an hour a day for health. It's something you do 24 hours a day to remain connected to God and ultimately go back home, back to God. Which brings us to our practice. Now, here's a tip. If you know any from any India or you're traveling in India, here's one question you don't ask anybody from our culture. What do you believe? It has no meaning. In the Western, it's all about what we believe. I believe this, I believe this. The question to ask is, what do you practice? What do you practice? You can believe any darn thing. That horses produce eggs, that flowers grow in the sky. You can believe any crazy thing. But what do you practice? Because it is through practice that those truths are going to be integrated. That those truths are going to become part of you. The practice which is most practical, not only for this age, but for those of us who are not going to be able to go out and live in a cave in some remote part of the Himalayas 
that practice which is most effective and universally recommended. Kalo Tad Hari Kirtana. In this age called Kali Yuga, the most effective way of connecting to God is through the chanting of His holy names. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. The Sanskrit word mantra, man is the source of our English word mind, and trauma means to deliver. If you want to be delivered from the misconception that you're this body, that life is temporary, then chant the names of God. That will remind you on a daily basis. Someone says, well, I chanted, nothing happened. It'd be like saying, well, I ate a week ago. How come I'm hungry again? Well, you have to eat daily. Take a shower, you smell bad. Well, I showered a year ago. Well, I'm sorry, but you have to shower every day. You not only get clean, but you keep clean. You not only get nourished, but you keep nourished. Chanting once and done is not going to do it. I'm sorry to break it to you. It should be a daily practice because that's what practice means. It's something you do consistently, you do daily. And the rewards will be significant. Krishna says, Tesham Satya the Yuktanam, those who connect with me consistently and daily by serving me with their tongue in terms of chanting my holy names and eating only vegetarian food, which has been offered to me in love and devotion. To them, I give the knowledge to which they can come to me, go back home, back to God. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Let's raise our hands, if any of that sounds good to you, and a little more, more robustly, chant the mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.